Neil Brown just has that it factor, I believe. He's bought into the program. Everybody in the Big 12 is going to know his name, and all the quarterbacks are going to feel his pain. That underdog so. mentality has always been big for West Virginia. Well, we're just heartbroken that we were not good at our jobs. He is the modern-day Don Nealon. Trust the climb. And now it's time for the Country Roads Webcast. What's going on, Mountaineer Nation? Welcome into another edition of the Country Roads Webcast. As always, I'm your host, Jordan Cruz, and we've got a special treat for you here today as I had the privilege to sit down for a Country Roads conversation with former West Virginia offensive lineman Brian Joswiak, who played for the Mountaineers from 1982 through 1985, ending his career as a consensus All-American his senior season before going on to be the seventh overall pick in the NFL draft. But before we get to that, if you're watching on the YouTube side, do me a favor, give us that thumbs up, hit that like button, that helps. And also, as always, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, helps us, helps you, helps get this Mountaineer football content out to more of Mountaineer Nation. If you're listening on the audio side, be sure and check out our YouTube if you haven't already, Country Roads Webcast. Got some YouTube exclusive things we're doing on there that's different than just the long form version of the podcast you hear on the audio side. But if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, give us a rating, that helps. Any other podcast platform you're listening on, you know, you can find us on Google Podcasts, Stitcher. Spotify, you name it, you can find the Country Roads webcast there. But be sure and share us if you're listening on any of those platforms. That helps as we're trying to grow the podcast here, heading into our fifth year in 2022. But before we get there throughout the offseason, we're going to hopefully keep coming with some of these Country Roads conversations with former Mountaineers. And this is a good one as I get the chance to sit down with former West Virginia offensive lineman Brian Joswiak. So with no further ado, I'll stop rambling. Let's get into it. Here it is, Mountaineer Nation, my Country Roads conversation with former West Virginia offensive lineman, Brian Joswiak. All right, Mountaineer Nation. There have only been 12 consensus, consensus All-Americans in WVU's football history. We are lucky enough to be joined by one of those 12 today for our Country Roads conversation. Joining me today, West Virginia Sports Hall of Famer, former seventh overall pick in the NFL draft, and of course, consensus All-American at WVU, Brian Joswiak, so thankful for you to be on. Brian, how you doing? Oh, Jordan, thank you for having me. You know, anytime we get a chance to talk about Mountaineer football, I'm I'm all in, brother. I'm all in, no matter where I'm Absolutely. at. Right, always a Mountaineer, always a Mountaineer. So thanks yeah, for having a Mountaineer, me. Always a Mountaineer. Yes, sir. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. Really, oh, uh, really excited. And uh, I guess we can just go back. You know, we'll take the listeners back to kind of where it all all began for you as far as WVU. Uh, what just talk about a little bit about your recruitment to WVU. Had you heard of WVU prior to being recruited? I know you were early in Don Nealon's tenure. I don't know, were you in his first recruiting class or was it his second? The first complete I'm, recruiting class. First there complete was, class. Was, That's what I thought, yeah. Um, there was a makeshift group that came in that first year when he took over. Guys like Bill Legg out of Polka. Uh, those were, right. in fact, I think Billy Legg was his first uh, scholarship athlete. But, you know, he he only had a, he got there in the spring, so he only had a limited amount of time to go out and pick. But 81 was his first complete class, and I was part of that 81 group. I was out of Catonsville, Maryland, which is Baltimore, which is where I'm sitting, actually, right now. I'm in Catonsville. Wow. <laughs> All the peeps in Baltimore go Comets, you know what I'm saying? But uh, no, I, I got recruited, uh, you know, as, as a high school senior back in, in 1980, you know, when you're a 6'6", 300-pound kid running around the field, you know, it's easy to pick you out. And of course, they didn't have the media like they do now and the ability to, you know, use huddle and, and pull film. Uh, in order to find you, they had to go to you. Well, where I went to high school, nobody came there. There was a coach that uh, was the head coach at a, a local prep school uh, uh, in the Catholic League, you know, Mount St. Joe, and they always got – recruiters coming through there and that guy would send them over to Catonsville high school. You got to go look at this big kid, man. Holy crap. You know, he can't hardly walk and chew gum, but if somebody will work on him, man, he could be because he's big as a house. And, uh, and that's how the whole thing started the recruiting process. And, you know, quite honestly, Jordan, uh, you know, I was from Baltimore, you know, Went camping a little bit. I mean, I thought West Virginia was the western side of Virginia. I didn't know a whole heck of a lot about the Mountaineers. 
Uh, you know, Maryland Terrapins is what I heard all the time. And, uh, you know, I, quite honestly, I never thought I was going to play college football. I was a high school, you know, it, it just it, – it, it just kind of happened, and, it's, and there I am, you know, and, and I got recruited pretty heavily and took visits, took official visits, and uh, West Virginia was one of the official visits. Thank you, Bob Simmons, uh, who came to the high school and saw me in the gym and and uh, invited me to come out for an official visit. And I took trips to uh, West Virginia, Nebraska, North Carolina, Wake Forest, Maryland, uh, and Penn State. Those were my, my six back then. And uh, – you know, something special about West Virginia, uh, the people, the experience, Morgantown, uh, brand new stadium, Don Nealon, young coaching staff, hungry, uh, some pretty damn good players there ready to buy in like Daryl Talley and Oliver Luck and that group. Hey, man, this would be a great opportunity for you. So I took a visit and, you know, fell in love. Uh, took a visit to North uh, to, to Nebraska the following weekend after my West Virginia visit, a little sidetrack there. And uh, when I came back, I, I told my dad, I was like, dad, you got to take off money and drive me back to Morgantown. I, I got to make sure I got to know in my gut, you know, it doesn't matter about anything else. Everything else is window dressing. Is this where I'm going to be for the next, you know, four or five years of my life and, and, and love every minute of it. And uh, of course, you know, West Virginia was the was the call. And I think Don Nealon sealed the deal uh, when he showed up at my house in Catonsville with two really big bags of fresh kielbasa. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, man, was Polish to the core. And uh, Nealon showed up with Bob Simmons and, and Donnie Young, and they got these big bags of, of sausage and my old man's like, Hey, you're going to West Virginia, boy. <laughs> that's, that's oh, how it started. Awesome. And, uh, yeah, man, uh, that, that's how it started. That that's, that's what got me to West Virginia. Some great recruiting, uh, some, some opportunity that I saw. And, uh, you know, I just fell in love with the people everywhere. He turned around. People were like, hi, how you doing? What's your name? Where are you from? Oh, my goodness, you've all fucked up. And it was everybody. And it was all about, you know, Mountaineer football. It wasn't about nothing else. And uh, that really excited me. And I wanted to be a part of that. And thank God I made that decision because, you know, we, we laid the foundation for where we are today on top Absolutely. of the foundation that was already laid by the history of that program that goes back, you know, 120 years or whatever. So, uh, yeah, proud to be a Mountaineer, made the right decision for sure. Absolutely, and I think West Virginia would would, would agree the, the same for sure with how everything's you know, going out quit. in your career. Uh, brother, really? I almost quit. Uh, oh, wow. I, was, I was like this close to quitting, and I'll share that with you. Take two minutes. But I, yeah, I go right Yeah, it. absolutely, it, absolutely. You know, People don't understand it. Kind of, it kind of boggles my brain how some of these noodle necks can sit on the on the corner over there and razz players and say all kinds of negative things about them and and you know whatever wins and losses been. Go wear them cleats for a little while. Put a helmet on and and work it out for a week, and then you come back and and lay all that back on me. You know the 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 work, the the demand, and that first year, I, I, you know, Nealon was running them off. You know, if you ain't in it, you're out. And and the young guys and all that stuff. And and our our camp, our camp in August was freaking ridiculous. These these guys that play today, yeah, they look great, but I don't think they could have handled that kind of pressure where it's every day, man. You don't get off. You know, you hit spring ball, you hit 20 days in a row back then. Now you gotta, you wow. gotta hit and then you gotta wear a, you know a shirt and, and you can't hit two days in a row and you got to have the weekends off, whatever. Yeah. It's different, man. It's way different today. But anyway, so we're in camp and uh, I was a little overweight. You know, I was about 300, 310 pound, most of it. Ugh. Uh, but I was, I was working in as a starting nose guard on the defense as a true freshman. And uh, we're in the middle of drills and it's hot and it's a second. And them guys used to go out there in that heat. And they take big fire hoses and they wet that field down, man. And the freaking humidity <laughs> would come off of it. Oh, oh, it was hot as cow udders, man. Unbelievable. Yeah. Anyway, 
Uh, at the end of practice, at the end of the two a day, Nealon would stand there with an index card that one of them equipment cronies would give him. And it had names of guys that, that screwed up. You know, you violated this little rule. You didn't do this. You didn't do this. And he'd read them off and you'd have to do a little extra running. Well, that day, my name got called for leaving my chair out of my locker. Now, I didn't. Oh, no. Brother, I've looked at that chair 400 times because I ain't running extra. I'm a fat kid. I don't need to run no more than I have to. <laughs> and that chair was out of my locker. Later on, I found out it was Daryl Talley that yanked it out of there. Thank you, Daryl. Ah. Anyway, so I got to do this freaking. You got to bear crawl 100 yards, and then you got to drop down and log roll all the way freaking back to the goal line. Well, I don't know if you ever log rolled on 120 degree AstroTurf, but about the third roll around, puke flies out of your face. Okay. And you got no chance. And I'm losing it. I'm thought I'm going to die. I swear to God, my body, I, I have, I mean, I've pushed my body to the brink. I mean, I've, I've taken myself right. where, where it's scary to be because you think you're going to shut down. And bro, if it wasn't for, a bunch, I heard, I heard, hey, big seven, seven, let's go. Jones, we got here in the echo, you know, I'm rolling. And I got Bill Kerlavich, for those of you that don't remember Bill Kerlavich, he was the craziest, best defensive line coach I've ever known in college football ever, Bill Kerlavich. But, you know, Bill couldn't finish a sentence without using the F-bomb. He used his right. adjectives and adverbs and that now, blah, blah, blah. And he was in my grill that whole time yelling, you effing brown. And I finally make it. And I get to the goal line and they scoop me up and everybody breaks down and we run into the locker room. Now I'm staggering to the locker room. I got puke dripping off my face mask. I'm like, screw this. I'm I don't need this crap. No way. Honest to God. And I get to my locker. I'm sitting in my locker and freaking Kurlavich comes up and he gets right in my ear, he grabs him by the shoulder, gets right in my ear. And he says, Joe's react. He says, you got to hang in there, big man. He goes, he goes, you're going to be, you're going to be, you got what it takes, man. You just got to hang in there. You're, you're going to be special. And he, and he walked away and I'm sitting there thinking, man, that was, that was, that's pretty awesome. That, you know, he didn't need to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate it, but I'm quitting anyway. Screw that. This sucks. It's too hard. So I go back to the dorm. I couldn't even eat. I was so sick. I went home. I called my old man. I called my dad. Dad, hey, guess what? Uh, you got to come get me. What? I said, I, I can't do this. I'm done. He, I, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. He, he says, you got two choices, boy. If you're quitting, he goes, you either go in the military or get a job. I've already converted your freaking room to a little den, a little rec room. Your bed's gone. You ain't coming back here. And I hear my mother in the background, Bob, who is that? It's your son. Let me talk to him. No, no, dad, come on, man. You got to come get me. Let me come home and I can do this. And I could hear my mother just in the background going, let me talk to him. And finally he said, hey, your decision, boy. Click. And he hung up. And I'm sitting there going, well, might as well, might as well, might as well suck it up, Buttercup, and 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 man, and, and from then on, uh, it just it just felt good. It, it it was tough. I mean, I took myself to that place, but then I wasn't afraid to take me there anymore, and I did it all the time. And and you have to to play at that high level of football. You got to be out of your comfort zone all the time, and you got to be able to press it well beyond of everything. At the same time blocking out all of the distractions that are out there and staying laser focused on the, on the target. Yep. So absolutely. Anyway. That's yeah. I, I love that, you know, cause that just shows, you know, it takes a certain type of toughness for sure, especially with the culture Don Nealon and those guys were building. But I do have to ask you after hearing that story, how pissed off was coach Kerlavich when you switched over to offense? <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> Here's what happened. Once we got into the season, I was the starting nose guard. And we were getting ready for our game opener, and we're down on the goal line. And this is, of course, before knee braces were being worn. And we were involved in a goal line scrimmage. Every Thursday, we'd run like eight goal line plays. We called them perfect plays to score. And it was it was brutal, man. It got, it got crazy. Oh, yeah. And in the middle of a drill, 
Dave, Dave Johnson was the center and Andre Gist was the guard. And they high load me. Oh, I blew my right knee out. I was in surgery that following Monday and on crutches. Uh, took about three weeks. Doug Bowers did a hell of a job. Arthroscopic repairs, did what they had to do. And within about four weeks, my big ass was back there, out there running and working. And I worked myself back into the lineup. And uh, son of a gun, if I didn't do the same thing and the same kind of drill uh, on my left knee, only this time it was Dave Johnson and freaking Mike the Rat. Wow. And my knee went out. So this time, this is a true story. This time I'm laying in bed in the hospital and I'm coming to, I'm coming out of the, the grogginess of the anesthesia. I'm laying there and I look over and my mom and dad are over here to my left and freaking Coach Nealon, Carl Battershell, and and at that time, no, that would have been, no, I think that was Carl first year, and Kerlap. And uh, Kerlap's got his head kind of down and the other guy's got his head up. And Coach Dillon's standing there, how you doing, boy? How you feeling? You know, anything you need, mom and dad, let me know. And me, and by the way, you're moving offense. Because they thought I was going to be susceptible wow. to knee injuries and you're moving offense. So I got to play a little bit of defense along the way. But, man, when you play on offense as an offensive lineman with a defensive disposition, that's a really fun position. Oh, I'll guarantee it. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. It was tailor-made. It was meant to be. Yeah. So, you know, and, and I moved offense and, and uh, you know, never really looked back. Uh, had to wait my turn, uh, an injury. Uh, you know, I was a number two tackle and Kurt Keel got injured in the Rutgers game up in up in the Meadowlands. And uh, when he got hurt, Joe's we at, you got to go in. That was halfway through the 82 football season. And, uh, you know, I went in there and, and uh, you know, had the, had the career – that I did. And, and it was only because of the people that were around me and put up with me and played next to me or behind me or, you know, on, on the defensive side of the ball or whatever that, that made all that happen. We, we were special, man. I mean, we were, I think, I think our record when, when I was there was like, like 38, 13 and one uh, with three oh, yeah. bowls, uh, three wins mm -hmm. in bowls. And, and, and that's, that's pretty solid. Uh, considering, you know, back then you couldn't get into a bowl game at six and six. Give me a break. Right. You had to, you right, had yeah, to it's too many of them nowadays. You know, you couldn't, you couldn't be out there beating University of Pacific and Ohio and think you're good. You got to beat big dogs, man. And you got to be able to handle that. And uh, that's what, you know, it, it, a lot of fun. Oh my God. Uh, I could talk about this stuff all night long, Jordan. You know, I, I love <laughs> this. It's good. Good. Absolutely. Good I, was say, I, lo I love the stories for sure, and I'm sure the, the listeners will love love them too. That's that's the good, good stuff, getting those, you know, kind of behind the scenes in, inside baseball, inside baseball type of stuff. And I, I kind of wanted to talk about, you know, you guys talked about your record there and how good you guys were. And I think Don Nealon, you know, that was early in his tenure, and he really took the program to new heights during his during his time there. And speaking back to, you know, when you said you didn't know a lot about West Virginia, you know, before you, before you came, and I think that was true for a lot of people because I think – Really, when Don Nealon came, you know, they created that West Virginia logo there, you know, not long after he came. And I, I remember Don Nealon say, saying, you know, after we beat Oklahoma in 1982, that that logo was on every damn truck in this state, you know. And so I think that just coming in from where West Virginia was when you came in to when you left in uh, 85, I know you guys had a great record, but just in that short of time, the program Don Nealon was building and what he built it into, just kind of if you want to speak about the program differences from when you first got here to where it was at when you left and then, you know, where Don Nealon would take it from there. No, he always had a vision, Jordan. He always – everything he did was calculated. Nothing was off the cuff. He knew he knew his his goal and, and where he wanted to take that program. And, you know, you got to think about a couple of things that he did strategically. Like you just said, you know – Nobody really knew about the Mountaineers. Nobody really knew about right. West Virginia, you know, and I was right over on, on the Baltimore coast and didn't, you know, really know much about West Virginia. But, but if, if you were living in West Virginia, you were all about West Virginia. Now we got to get the right. word out. And that's what coach Nealon did. He basically did two things that I think were, were key elements. First of all, he rejuvenated the Mountaineer faithful that are from the state that are Blue and gold in their bloodstream by grassroots, man. We used to go out 
I mean, I rode in a parade in, in one little town somewhere, and there was one freaking stoplight. And it was over. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? We were there, and, and we were part of them, and we wanted them to be part of us. And by God, that's what we're taking into the into the game. Not only are we playing with 100 guys, but we got 80 – thousand whatever you know what i'm saying and that's the, oh, yeah. number one number two the recruiting process you know he didn't recruit guys from california he, he took a stick pin and put it in a morgantown and he drew a circle about 300 miles in circumference and said hey find them they're there find them and then send doc holiday to florida and grab us some speed okay but it it was it it, it started here you know, it was it was West Virginia, and then Nealon expanded that by recruiting hard in Maryland, Delaware, Jersey, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania. There's enough foot West Virginia. I mean, it's there's enough football right there without going anywhere else. And that's what he did a great job of. And he, you know, it's three star, five star, but no, he went out and found football players. He found good good guys that didn't have a whole lot of baggage, that had the academic capability, and they were going to be hungry, and they were going to listen, and they were going to get after it. You don't have to be – let me tell you what, some of the best dogs I've ever known are mongrels. You don't have to be some thoroughbred to be a great player. you got to be a great player. you got to be Absolutely. in here willing to take what God gave you and hone it to a fine edge – to go out there and do battle. And, and that's, and that's what coach Nealon did. He got that W I see the, I see this symbol everywhere. I live in South Florida. I'm up here in Maryland. I, I see it in gas stations. And I usually, if I see it in time, I usually strike conversation with whoever it is. And, okay. You know, whether I, whether my name comes up or not, it doesn't matter. It's just all about, Hey man, where are you from? All right. All right. Yeah. I went there in the eighties, brother. Good time. You know, <laughs> absolutely. It's special. It's really special. And and that, you know, again, that Nealon and company uh, and and what he did, you know, rallying the, the money people in the state to get behind it, uh, you know, building the 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 Mac, the athletic program there, you know, having, you know, I mean, that 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 athletic department under Fred Shouse and it passed along, never ran in the red ever. That that was a self-sufficient, ran in the black hardcore. You know, I don't know what it's doing now. I think you know, somehow we got to pay for a fifty-six million dollar football facility. I don't have any money, so sorry, guys. I can't help you. All McAfee, freaking McAfee can just stroke there you go. be done with it, right? But uh, you know, anyway. So that's where I'm at, and and I, I you know, everything that happened during those years is a big part of what I am here going into my 60th orbit around the sun. And, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a thing and I kind of stuff highs and lows and everything in between. And I wouldn't change nothing. man. I mean, I'm so thankful uh, for all of it. Yeah. Yeah. And mostly, Absolutely. mostly to God thankful for, you know, the Mountaineer fans, man. I'm going to tell you something. The only experience I've ever experienced greater than the feeling I had in 1984 on Mountaineer Field when we beat Penn State, I, I, I'm, I got goosebumps everywhere right now. I mean, I swear to God, that feeling, the only way I can describe it is the birth of your first child. Wow. When, you, when that happens, I mean, you – it's just, you know, that is, is so special. And that the Mountaineer fans made that stadium. I mean, back, back when I played, you got to remember, man, on a Saturday in Morgantown, that stadium was the second largest city in the freaking state. Mm -hmm. I rest my case. Oh yeah. That was insane, man. Uh, you know, and then we got, we got demanding over the years because we got freaking pretty, you know, we've been always been pretty good. We've always been in the battle. 
we've had some great coaches. We've Absolutely. had some awesomely great players. And we've always been, you know, really close to being special with, with what we've had to work with, which is dynamite. That's the way I look at it. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's just, you know, here we are. Here we are in 2022, yeah. still hammering it out. So, yeah, pretty exciting. Yeah, it's it's different for West Virginia. I think you know the fans are are super passionate. That's one thing you can always say. And when you know, I know being at West Virginia, I'm sure is is special as a player. You know, like you said, you came from another state. But when you're here at West Virginia, you know, there's other colleges they have they have passionate fans too. But West Virginia is the only only show in town. You know, the only game in town. No pro team you know, in the state. So you're you're what this state has. Who they're cheering for. You don't have to worry about competing with you know, the, the Redskins or, you know, anything like that. You know, it's, it's just West Virginia. That's all they've got. Hey, and I give Neil Brown a lot of credit because, you know, you, you kept some pretty daggone fo good football players, you know, the oh, yeah. Wyatts and the Zach Frazier's and the and the, the, the two uh, biggins from, from Fairmont, uh, the brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, you look at that and you say, how, how would you love to be from West Virginia? At West Virginia, you know, living living the dream, man. I, I mean that mm -hmm. that that's really something special, and it's and it is exciting. And you know, hey, we are demanding. I mean, we're Mountaineer we're Mountaineer fans. We're Mountaineer faithful. Uh, you know, but it takes time. Philosophies change. Uh, you know, we're. I, I hear the the thing about trust the climb. You know, mm -hmm. excuse me, we've been climbing since you know eighteen whatever. Uh, right. You know, we've reached close. Oh my God, that eighty-eight team, that that early nineties. What year was it? Like ninety-four, uh, ninety-three, I believe. Ninety-three. There you go. And and we got so close, and it didn't happen. So you know, you're back to the climb. It's, you know, how many times do you gotta you gotta hit the 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 trail to get to the top, and you know, get knocked off? I mean, it's a story of life. It's the way it works. Uh, but uh, you know, I. I I think, you know, we took a little sidestep with the previous coach. Uh, I was never really a fan and, you know, whatever. We're not going to get into that. But uh, when they brought when they brought Coach Brown in, there was a there was a uh, a transporter that took me back to seeing Coach Neal in, in his early years, somebody giving him a shot, you know, coming out of Bowling Green, you know, as, a, as an assistant at, at Michigan and then having a chance, a, a chance to really take a, a, a young program somewhere, you know, that that's what Neil Brown kind of stepped into. And, you know, the first couple of the first year or two, I mean, hell, he had to deal with what was left to him, which the coffers were a bit bare. Uh, and wow. then you had to deal with COVID. And then all of a sudden you got to deal with this freaking portal. Uh, the portal ought to be on Star Trek. We don't. That's the dumbest damn thing that's ever happened to college football, and it's you. You should be able to transfer if there's a major problem, but you can't just transfer and play. You, you need to sit out. The NCAA has opened up a couple of of Pandora's boxes that we're never going to get jammed back in. So it is what it is. Those that are playing and coaching and dealing with it, let them deal with it. It, it just sucks. But uh, you know, anyway, putting all that together and and seeing. Where I mean, God, we were so close last year. Oh yeah, think about it. You win, a, you win one or two of those games that we lost by a couple of points, and all of a sudden the game changes in here for those guys, and the locker room chemistry changes, and you go out and maybe win another two games, and all of a sudden you're in a bigger bowl. Uh, you know where they are now. You know, uh, brother. You know he's got himself a solid. Corral of young quarterbacks, and then Green, he's an older guy, uh, but he's still a younger. Uh, and then you got a, a new offensive coordinator, which which Coach Brown, and he's a self-analyzer, man, and he figured it out. Uh, he said, Hey, I, you know, I'm the CEO of this big operation. I can't be sitting in the in the room cutting offensive film and working, you know, play call and all that. I don't have time for that. I got to deal with all this other right. crap. So let him do that. And he brings in a, a, a heck of a resume to run the offense. And uh, the offensive line is going to be a year older, uh, you know, defensively. I mean, you know, we've lost some guys. You know, so what? Go. 
you don't want to be here. Go. We don't want you. Goodbye. And this crap about always a mountaineer, once a mountaineer, always a mountaineer. Yeah. Only if you freaking graduate from there. You bail out. You ain't no mountaineer no more. I hope I see you in a freaking gas station. I'll tell you to your face. All right. Once, always a mountaineer. Once a mountaineer, always a mountaineer is only if you stay a mountaineer. You go do something else, you're on your own, buddy. That's the way I look at it. Right. We only want people that are going to want to be here and do what they're doing. And trust me when I say those ones that hit the portal got all the wrong ideas in their head. Let them go. We don't mm-hmm. need that crap. We got enough to worry about. And and I'm I, I you know and I'm the optimist. I, I just I try to find all the good and and in, in, in as much as I can because I want to win as much as the next guy. Oh yeah. Where we've got to get is now we've got, and Coach Neal always said this, and it's been part, you got to find a way to win. You you know, it's it's not about the play call. It's not about, it's about finding that that desire, that freaking burn. You got to find a way to win. Who's going to make the big play? You know, if, if I'm on the backside of a, of a, of a, a right toss sweep, you know, do I just lay down and, you know, maybe my guy makes a tackle 10 yards down. And if I'd have made that block, our guy could have scored. You know what I'm saying? Taking it to right. that level, finding that way to win. We didn't, we're getting close. You know, they need to, you know, the offensive line has that Zach Frazier, man, that freaking kid, that, that kid's going to play Especially. on Sunday. God, God, he don't get injured. He, I mean, sky's the limit for him. And he plays with, with a, a fire. If everybody jumps on that, and and goes with that, you know, we could be we could be pretty daggone special with the dynamics that's going to be brought to it. You know, to let Coach Brown make big decisions. Let that coordinator get into a groove and call plays. I can't be calling plays and getting ready for the next series if I'm worrying about what the defense is or do we need to punt or not. You know, let, let I'll you handle the freaking play call. That's going to be a dynamic this year that I think is going to really uh, make a difference for us on Saturdays or Thursdays or whenever we play. When, I mean, whatever no, day. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, no, I'm, yeah. I'm really excited about that one too. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. Think I think, I think, I think it's a, it's a great addition. Cause I think when you look back, uh, especially in you know, the past couple of years, West Virginia's had had a good team, and as you said, been in about every game. And the defense has really been been solid all along. If your offense, you know, could just put it in the end zone a couple more times, you know, score when you needed it. I think if you improve the offense, you got a chance to have a really solid team. Absolutely. And I'm glad you brought up the the similarities between Neil Brown and, and Don Nealon because that's something that you know, as a fan, I've said you know since we got Neil Brown, I was trying to tell everybody you know be patient, give this guy some time because. Really, I, I've, I've called him, you know, personally on our podcast before, I've called him the modern-day Don Nealon because I think that he has – I know you talked about Don Nealon's recruiting strategy with the 300-mile radius around West Virginia, and yep. I think that Neil Brown's done similar as well as, you know, plucking some guys, you know, from other places that he can, but periodically, you know, staying in those kind of five surrounding states around uh, West Virginia, and he's done a really good job. And I, you know, wanted to get into this this West Virginia team and how you think Neil Brown is, is building it and what do you think the future – holds for West Virginia moving forward now that Neil Brown, you know, you talked about some of the attrition and I think some of it's addition by subtraction, you know, not maybe some of these guys were told, you know, they weren't fit and it'd be better if they found another place. Cause if you look, you know, you talked about the previous staff, a lot of those guys were recruited by that previous coaching staff. And with Neil Brown, it's a whole different mentality, whole different culture that he's trying to install. And I think he's got about all his guys here now and got the culture in place. So I think we're about to really turn the corner, but I just want to get your thoughts on the program under Neil Brown and what he's building and what the future could hold with him as the coach. That's just it is the the key word is build. You know, you're constantly building and rebuilding. Anytime you bring in a new, excuse me, philosophy or a new thought process or new language or or whatever, a new system, you know, it, it takes time to, to, you know, everybody get on board from, you know, the, the secretary to the guy emptying the wastebasket to, you know, whomever has to all buy into that. That doesn't happen overnight. You know, everybody gets excited about a new coach, but the, the real deal is it takes time to, to build that and bring that on, at, you know, especially at a place like Morgantown. And, uh, you know, Neil, Coach Brown's done, done that. He's, you know, he's very calculating. Uh, he, he's one of those guys that, that plans it out. 
and you know he he sticks to it, but he's he's willing to evolve, but he's not going to leave his his base philosophies, and, and he's gonna you know he's gonna hold on to those, and uh, you know he he's just. You know, I've I've liked him. I've liked him a lot since day one. And you know, first time I met him was like thirty seconds in the hallway, and I just saw his energy and and how he was handling himself and and talking to the people around him. And you know, it just it was like, man, this guy's got it going on. I'll share this with you, uh, and and I think I'm okay in in, in saying this because it's a real positive thing. Uh, I was at a uh, thing at USF. My son's a USF Bull graduate, uh, was an all-conference offensive lineman there. Now he's the head coach at Clearwater High School. And they had a, a, a thing there to um, bring some kids in. And and it was, a you know, for the junior class recruiting stuff. So my son's like, Dad, you want to go? I was like, heck yeah. He's taking a couple of kids that are getting recruited very heavily, uh, been offered, you know, everywhere. And, and he wanted to take them over there. And of course, you know, Coach Trick is now the offensive coordinator at USF. And we were all hanging out. And of course, he comes over and gives me a hug. He played in the golf tournament a couple of times. And, you know, I know his old man pretty well, et cetera. And uh, anyway, so I, it, it kind of it kind of lulled out a little bit. And I walked over and I said, hey, hey, Trick, come here a minute. I said, I got to ask you something. I said, no, I'm, I'm never going to repeat anything. But I am right now because it's a good thing. And, and I was like, hey, you know, I was like, well, what's come on, man. You know, we only know about 30 percent of what goes on. So, you know, most of what goes on and how it goes on, like you said, you know, you you might have a kid who hit the portal because they had a meeting with the coach and the coach said, hit the portal, take a bus ticket, get out. We don't need you, whatever. You don't know any of that. It's all behind closed door stuff. Right. But uh, uh, as I say, man, I lost my train. Uh Talk about uh, Travis Trickett. And, uh, oh, so, so I said, hey, hey, you know, tell me. A little. And from the first second, man, he perked up. He goes, man, he goes, he goes, Coach Brown is one of the freaking best coaches I've ever been around. And here's a guy who grew up in it. He's been around a lot of good coaches over his years. Oh, yeah. And his, you know, block, he's like, Coach is one of the, one of the most dedicated self-evaluators, uh, organized to the teeth, loving family man, open door policy with the players, knows them all, knows all their families, just just one of these guys. And for the three or four minutes that we were doing this, talking about it, he just – he couldn't say enough great positive things about him. Now here, this guy, and he knows me, and he knows that, I, you know, if he was going to tell me, yeah, the guy, they, 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 I'd, I'd hold that like a trap door. I wouldn't say anything and I'd never even, but I'm telling folks this because here's a guy who, who lived and breathed with him behind closed doors. And, you know, and, and had nothing but praise and, and love and devotion for the guy. So that, that really makes me like the guy even more, uh, you know, now, you know, of course, you know, I'd like to win. You know, because winning ultimately for us is is where you you measure. Sorry, it, it just is what it is. Let's call it what we need to call it. You know, you you win. It's the best deodorant there is, right? Oh yeah. If you're losing, they'll pick up the scent right, all the way around the corner. But if you're winning, it changes things, and and we're so close. And once that happens, watch it. Just just watch it. And and Neil will be here because we don't have twenty million dollars to buy him out. So yeah. you know he's going to be here till the end of his contract, unless that Ken Kendrick can come up with some more cash, or maybe call Pat McAfee. <laughs> he's got it. He's got it. <laughs> I tried to call. He won't answer my calls. I'm like, hey Pat, man, <laughs> spot me a few bucks, please. That guy's that guy's everywhere. He's that's crazy, isn't that it? Big, yeah. Oh, no, that's yeah. that's wild. Yeah, because that's there's, there's that's too you know one of the teams the I grew up watching was that 2007 team. So it's almost surreal now, you know, because uh, like that was I think my freshman year of high school that 2017 that should have played for the national championship, and of course that game against Pitt we won't talk about. So uh, seeing you know those guys and it don't feel that long ago to me, but I guess it is a while ago now. You know, seeing him on WWE and having his own show and on uh, ESPN and all that's pretty surreal. Do you know what's wild? 
this, let me just share this. All right. All this right, is, this is my in. personal, everything I say is my personal opinion. If I offend somebody, it is what it is. Uh, you know, whatever, uh, whatever, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's, it's what I yeah. think. Uh, but, uh, it, it, it's it's too much money, okay? And I get it, but I don't. And entertainment. Enter, enter, how is it that the freaking basketball coach is the the highest paid guy on campus? I mean, no offense, but that really should be the president or somebody. Right. You know, you know there's it, it, it's it, there's just there's 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 just so much money involved. And, and it's like, you know, everybody wants a piece of the pie. But, the, you know, come on, man. It's a freaking game, bro. It's it's a game. It, it's This is all entertainment. You know, I go listen to some live music, you know, put some money in a tip jar. I mean, because I, I like the band, you know. It's it's entertainment. Right. No offense, but, you know, this podcast, it's it's entertainment. Somebody's going right. to tune in and go, yeah, this is cool. Or, nah, it sucks. I'll never, you know, but it, it's entertainment. It's something that, whatever. But now you sprinkle in the freaking, the money that's involved. You know, you, do you realize in medieval times, you know, entertainers were either in an arena, you know, I'd have been a gladiator, right? That, you know, I'd have been out there Absolutely. cutting people up or getting <laughs> killed myself or, you know, and then you got the court jester, who's the comedian or the entertainer and, and you come in and you don't make that guy laugh. They beheaded you. They didn't pay you $48 million to yeah, throw a football down the field. You know, I mean, <laughs> Holy crap. It's just, it's so out of control. The money, the, the, the money that's involved is so out of control and it's, and it's all about entertainment and probably mm-hmm. gambling probably has a lot of edge in, involved in that too. But, you know, I mean, I just – I don't get it, man. I just – I'm the same way. Well, it is what it is. I understand. Uh, but, you know, I mean, holy macro. I mean, when I got drafted in, in the 86 draft as the seventh player taken, my signing bonus was $750,000. My first-year contract was for $98,000. Wow. Okay. Had I had gotten drafted last year as the seventh player taken, I'd have had a front-loaded bank account that would have had about $18 million in it. Mm-hmm. $18 million to do what? That's insane. To play football? <laughs> That's insane. That's, That's... – God. What? It's insane. And, it, what, and it's like at what point does it stop? Because each year you see it's going up. The contracts are getting higher. The con- And now the college players – or, you know, that college players making million, you know, that they're going to be making almost as much as they will on their rookie deal in college. You know, you got reports of players, you know, two, three million dollars in college. And it's if that's going to continue to raise it because the NFL is going to have to pay the guys more if they're making more in college now. So it's like, at what point, where's the cutoff? Well, you know, you, you, you know, you bring up like in college with the NIL stuff, the and, and or NLY or whatever it is, uh, mm-hmm. you know, eventually. Eventually, when you when you cut enough out of a pie, the pie's gone. Okay, yep. so wherever the money's coming from, whoever you want to call it, wherever you want to call it, it's coming from somewhere. Eventually, it doesn't come anymore. It can't come because you can't bleed water out of a rock. And you know you're going to divert money into this to help pay that, but then you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Who's going to pay this? And and you know schools like in Morgantown where hey. You know, you don't have a two billion dollar endowment. You know, have fun. I mean, you know, the the car dealer down the road can help you as much as they want, or the you know. But at, at the end of the day, who's who's got the deepest pockets to afford the most? I mean, it's it's out of control, and and, and the cat's yeah. out of the bag. I mean, you ain't gonna put it back. It is what no, it is. Can't. So so you got to deal with it. And you got to manage it, and somehow there's got to be some sort of regulation. You know, like like if I'm giving you money on top of your scholarship or I give you a car or whatever, do you pay taxes on it? Should you pay taxes on it? Right at this point, I don't think it is because a lot of these entities that are formed are nonprofits. Yep. So what they're doing is they're raising nonprofit money and they're giving it to a player to be at that school. That's income, man. 
you know, yep. are you going to have to pay taxes on that? Or should that come? It's it, oh, it's a mess, man. And, and they it's, a, it it's one of those Pandora box deals and have fun with it. I'm glad I ain't in it. I think it's wrong. I hate it. I, I just yeah. and me, dude, I had a mohawk. I gave, I gave great interviews. If I was living in today's market right now, I'd, I'd be doing oh. it too. Probably you have oh, yeah, to absolutely get what you can when you can because it's allowed. If if it's if it is what it is, then I'm gonna go get mine. I mean, you know, throw right. money in the air. I'm not just gonna stand there and watch it blow in the wind. I'm gonna grab me a few hundred. You know what I mean? But you know, it is what it is. I I don't like it. I, I think it's yeah. This is what I think too. And if you don't mind me saying, now I'm not in the locker room. Um, I'm not with those guys. Uh, I was in my locker room with with our guys, with my guys, and. You know, you, you develop a trust, you develop a, a camaraderie. Now, all of a sudden, you're sitting in a locker room where, you know, I'm doing the same stuff you are, and you're getting paid, and I'm not. What's up with that? Yeah, that's, so that's now, the issue you're going into. What I can get, let me tell you something. If your locker room isn't together and tight, if it's all about me and I'm getting mine, you, you have fun with that because when we get back to finding a way to win, you find a way to win when you got a whole sideline that's in the same direction no matter what. I don't care if you're down by two, three scores, man. We're going to win this game and we're going to do it together. Well, you know, one guy's getting paid, one guy's not. One guy, you know, I, I, man. It's not it's not an even playing field anymore when it comes to that. Everybody's getting something different. Uh, and the potential for that lures me into the portal to go places and, and whatever. And, and here's the other piece of this, Jordan. This is the one that kind of scares me a little bit. These guys that are playing in, in college football right now, okay, whether they're getting any money or not, these guys that are playing in college football now got a real rude awakening. Because there's only a sliver of them that are going to play in the league, and most of them are going to be like oh. me out in three years. Okay, now what? When you when you go into that stadium in, in Morgantown and you go into that locker room facility and you see all that, and you go, "That's a fifty-six million dollar facility." Oh my God! And you come out of there and you got a degree in education, and you're going to be a high school coach, and you're going to go live in a locker room that you're killing roaches every day. So you you go from, oh, it, I hate to say it like this, but it's almost like a fantasy world. I mean, right. you they got a freaking barber shop in there, bro. They yeah. want the gold, yeah. man. You know, and and I'm and I'm and it's great, and I love it. And I'm proud to be a mountaineer, and you know, but I I wouldn't have known how to act in that locker room, you know, because I beat on lockers and I wore my cleats in there and threw tape on the floor, and you know, well, you know. That and right. and now you go in there and it's like it's like a it's like a club. It looks like a club. I'm like, yeah. I don't oh, even yeah. know where to, I wouldn't even know where to sit. You know, it's like. Ooh. <laughs> but, but what happens now is when you leave that and you go into the real world that you're going to live in. Whoo, man! Is that a is that a? I mean, you want to talk about withdrawal? Whoo! So. You know, have fun, you know, you know what I mean? It's just, it's too out of control. I mean, are you kidding me? Uh, you know, and I love it. And I, you know, football is the greatest game on the planet. Cause at the end of the day, all that crap don't mean nothing when you go out there on that grid and you're playing that game, no matter what level you put a helmet on and you go out there and play that game. That is a, that's a special game. It's a, it's a oh man. It, what it's done for so many, so many folks, uh, me, absolutely, me. Uh, it's been a great game, but man, there's a lot of, whew, a lot of wacky stuff that's going on, man. And, uh, you know, all I could do is watch. I don't have any answers, brother. All exactly. I got <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Same. I, th I think that's everybody right now. It's college football's in a real fragile state right now. That's what I've been saying for sure. And that's, 
I don't know where it's going to go. I don't know if the NCAA is going to regulate it. I don't know if it's going to end up breaking away from the NCAA altogether. You, you know, it's it's hard to tell where it's going, but you know, I'm here here for the ride, and hopefully, whatever happens, it's it's good for the Mountaineers in the future. Hey, that's that's you, all we you, hope. You can only control what you can control, and right now, I think the only thing we need to worry about is playing bit. Yeah, exactly. That's that's right. that's what I'm and, excited and, for, and that's what they're doing in that locker room. They're not they're not talking about. They're not talking about anything more than pit. Yep. They're not, you know, you can't, you know, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now, man. It's, it's a crazy time for a lot of people. I can't control that. I have to live in it. I got to manage it, but I can't control any of it. The only thing at the end of the day that I can control is what's right here, you know? And uh, and that's the way those guys are right now. They're you know in in them walls, in them weight room workouts, in them five o'clock. You know when they're doing all this stuff, when they're eating dinner together, and, and they're you know the only thing that they're talking about is pit. Yep. You know, and and that's and that's exciting because you know that's that's the kind of guy that Neil Brown is. I mean, he really, you know, that's that's his mentality. He 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 keeps it. He keeps it right here. And it's hard to do, you know, social media. I mean, there's so many distractions right now. I mean, thank God these things didn't exist when I was in school. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a whole, a whole different ball game. <laughs> I understand that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but they always yeah. said, hey, man, you know, plausible deniability, right? So long right. As no pictures. You can say whatever you want about me. It's not true. I'll deny yep, exactly. No, and I'm now if somebody can snap a picture and have it out to a thousand people in 30 seconds, you know, well, that's just it, man. I don't, I mean, I, and I told you at the beginning of this thing, you know, I, I am what I am and, and I've done what I've done in every 24 hour segment of the time I've been here, you know, and, and it's, you know, it is what it is. And, and, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I, I don't, that's all, that's all you can say. It's, it is what it is, you know, so <laughs> Absolutely. Can't, can't, can't doctor it up, can't butter it up, you know, but I'm just glad there ain't many pictures that are in existence. <laughs> Only yeah, that's, pictures in people's memories, Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, I love it. Absolutely. But no, I'm, I'm glad, you know, they are focused on Pitt and I agree with you. I think that that's, should be the focus in the locker room. And I think Neilburn's going to keep those guys focused because that's that's a big game. You're talking about a pit team that's going to be ranked in the probably in the top 25 and uh, rivalry coming back that we've been missing for a while. So everyone's going to excited to see. And if you can go out this year and get a big road win to start the season, that's going to be huge. Uh, hey. Big check mark in Neil Brown's corner. Can I tell you another little quick story? Yeah, absolutely. Right? About absolutely. about the pit game. Now, of course, yeah. pit. You know when. when you know, my memories of the pit game are, are just incredible battles. And, and it don't matter what your record is. You know, when you're playing pit, I mean, that, come on, man. That, that's just, that's just such a rivalry. And you know you're going to be in a three-and-a-half-hour street fight. All right? That's the kind of mentality it is. And, and you know, rivalries, uh, whether they're you – know, they're special, man. They're, they're, they're very special. And uh, that – the, the uh, I'm in a I'm in a little retirement village rec hall, and I'm gonna listen to Rick K and the All Nighters. All right, they're a band out of Morgantown. They travel all over the place. They've been together for 30 years or whatever. Used to see them play in Morgantown when I was in school, and they're still together. Rick K and the All Nighters. Wow. So I, I contacted him, and he's bringing his group in, and they're gonna play. Okay. So I, I'm like, hey man, can I can I come listen? I'd love to come. He's like, well, you know, it probably it probably really isn't your crowd, Joe's, because you know it's a lot of older people, and you know. And I'm like, hey man, I just want to come hear some music. I want to hear you play, Rick. You know, all right, cool. So I get there a little while early, and we hung out a little bit. And anyway, they they go back there getting ready, and the people start showing up. And <laughs> brother, there's a lot of blue hairs, a lot of a lot of a lot of older <laughs> folks sitting in this oh, room and there's, it's, there's like 300 people in this room. I mean, it's packed and I'm standing, I'm standing in this back corner, just kind of minding my own business. And I'm standing there. And 
he breaks into Sweet Caroline. Oh, no. And on the oh, no. first refrain, I yell, eat shit, pimp! Yeah, absolutely. It stopped. They all looked at me. And I went, my near fan. My near fan. Sorry. And, and Rick, <laughs> you can't and not they, do it. They got right back into it and started singing. Oh, man. Again, the pit game. <laughs> you know, the West Virginia pit game, I got, again, I got chills, man. It, it's just – Absolutely. That's a special freaking game. And, and that's what they're – that's what those – because if you win that game, if you win that game, like you said, top 20 team, knock them off. Rivalry back on – boom. It just – it puts this train on a on a collision course uh, with a great season. So – Yep, I agree. I'm excited it's about it. I can't, I can't wait to see it and – I know I've, I've kept you longer than I said I would, but, you know, I really appreciate you coming on the Country Roads webcast. Let me pick your brain a little bit, getting some great uh, WV football stories and talking a little Mountaineers. But uh, before I let you go, just wanted to give you a chance. I know I know you've got the golf tournament. You've been having that, you know, what, over 30 years now, you know, helping raise money for the WV Children's Hospital. So I want to give you some time, you know, if you want to talk about that or anything else uh, you want to promote or, you know, just kind of let you have the floor here uh, no, the last no. little bit. Hey, I, I appreciate it. That – that right there, uh, this golf tournament, uh, July 14th and 15th up there in Morgantown. This will be our 32nd year, 32 years we've been doing this. Uh, myself and, a, and a, a guy by the name of Scott Sears, uh, we got this thing going along with some other folks back, you know, back in 1989, 1990, when I first got back from Kansas City. And, uh, you know, I always wanted to have a connection with Children's Hospital. Um, you know, Coach Nealon would take the players. We'd go up there wearing our jerseys on a Friday of a home game before we went out to Lakeview. Right after practice, we'd shower, put our stuff on. We'd get in a little van. We'd go over and visit the kids. And, uh, brother, I got hooked first time I went up there and, and, and saw, uh, you know, what was going on. And, you know, running that extra 40 in the heat really, really didn't compare to what that, that – nine-year-old kids going through up there, you know, chemo treatments and all. And, and it just, it, it really uh, made an impact in my soul. And I always, I always wanted to be a part of Children's Hospital. And, and you know, what better way to maintain a connection to WVU, WVU football, but, you know, to, to do something special in our own little corner uh, to, you know, assist Children's Hospital with, you know, whether it be funding or, or whether it be acquisition or, or, or whether it be just, you know, getting people to, to hear more about it, you know, awareness. And uh, anyway, we got this golf tournament going and, and it's a great time. We, we've, we've now renamed it several times over these many years. And it's, it, we call it the Legends Golf Tournament and we hold it at Lakeview, which is where our, us legends, us old guys used to stay. Um, you know, before games, it brings back a lot of memories, a heck of a golf course. And, uh, and we raise money and awareness. Uh, we're, we're teamed up. I have a, a nonprofit organization called Joe's Nose Kids. And we've teamed up with Hosteller and his foundation and, and some other entities and, and getting, getting some, some folks involved. And, and we put on a, a heck of a party, man. We, we got some great entertainment bands and, and we do it up. Thursday and Friday and, you know, all the proceeds go to uh, Children's Hospital and uh, they go to, uh, we've also supported uh, the Buddy Walk for Down Syndrome as well and being involved with them. So, uh, it, that, you know, and I'm a, I just retired in July. Uh, I coached uh, high school football and taught in high school over 20 years and, uh, you know, nine years in, in college down in Buchanan at West Virginia Wesleyan College. Okay, yeah. uh, so my life's been football, but, you know, what, what's most, what's most, uh, I don't even know what the word gratifying maybe mm -hmm. is what we've done uh, with, with, you know, and for the kids. The uh, it's all about yeah. the kids. It really is. You know, give them a chance, give them a chance, give them, give them what they need. And when they're in trouble, you know, try to provide them, uh, you know, with a way out, you know, so. Well said. Yeah. Well said. And that's, and that's a great cause. And uh, really, you know, admi admire that. And, uh, and, you know, anyone that, uh, you know, wants to get involved with that should definitely look into that because it's, it's a great cause and it's a, it's a great event, like as Brian said. And 
I just really appreciate you coming on and giving us a little bit of your time here on the Country Roads webcast. And uh, anytime you want to come back, you know, just let us know. We'll talk some Mountaineers. Hey, all you got to do is ask, brother. I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm retired. My schedule is like, <laughs> <laughs> that's you know, awesome. Hey, so, I really hey, appreciate, I appreciate it. it. Love talking Mountaineers and uh, always let's go Mountaineers. Absolutely. That's, that's how I was going to end this thing, as always. Let's go Mountaineers. Thank you, brother. Take care. Thank you. If you really want to know, then come on, let's go. Take a stroll down those.